My subject tonight probably can be summarized in one word. It's, it's, it's believe. I'm going to run a risk because I've touched on this subject here on this campus once before. It was either four years ago or six years ago. I can never remember exactly how many years ago, but it wasn't at camp meeting. It was in the chapel over at the girls' dorm. And that, that was, that's the first time I've ever been allowed in a girl's dorm in my whole life. If you're a preacher, they let you in. If you're a college student, they don't. <laughs> Believe. Our subject comes from Revelation chapter 7. After this, verse 9, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude. There's a, there's a pattern in the book of Revelation, and many of you have probably noticed it, that first John hears about something and then he sees it. So first he hears a voice like many waters, and then he turns and he sees the Son of Man dressed in, in, in pure white like a high priest. Or, or he hears about the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he turns expecting to see a lion, and he sees a lamb looking as if it's been slain. So he hears about the 144,000. It says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Father, I know that this moment it's too important to actually have someone like me stand here because I know who I am, I know where I've come from, and I always get nervous at the thought that I might have the opportunity to share what's in this book with anybody. And so I'm asking tonight that you would cover me with the blood of Christ that you would forgive my mistakes, that you would blow the dust out of my soul and make me fit for this hour. I pray that be true for all of us, that we would recognize above all else your voice in the pages of the Bible, and that when we hear it, we would find the courage and the conviction to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know where Amazon.com was when I was pastoring on the Alaska Highway. Back in those days, we didn't have Amazon.com, and we didn't have a bookstore in the town that I was pastoring in. The only bookstore was an hour and a half down the road in the next little town, and the only thing that they sold was Harlequin romances and coffee table picture books, and it did nothing to feed my heart and my soul. I used to have to wait for an entire year till camp meeting came, and when I drove to camp meeting, I would hit every bookstore on the 14-hour drive to camp meeting, every single one, and I would load up for the year. Where was Amazon.com when I was younger? Now I love Amazon.com. I think they have a special truck with my name on it. just delivers books to my house. And every time it delivers a book, it is an incredible occasion. As a matter of fact, once upon a time, I had an assistant who used to take the boxes from Amazon.com, and she knew that they were sacred, that she was not to open those. And she knew they were so sacred that she would actually draw a ribbon and a bow on it like it was my birthday. And I would go into my office and I would open that book and I would close the door. Everybody knew that if I got a brand new book, you don't bother Sean for the next 30 minutes or so. I want to thumb through that new title that I've got. I remember opening a box one day and I would pull out a book on ancient Babylonian history. And, and, and I, not the Nebuchadnezzar, Neo-Babylonian history. I'm talking Babylonian history way before that, dating all the way back to Nimrod and, and Hammurabi and all the way back. And I'm thumbing through the book. I'm sitting in my office with my feet up on the desk. And I get to about page 68, and I can't remember who I was reading about, some ancient Babylonian king, when this thought occurs to me, 
What are you doing reading a history book, Sean? You hate history. You hate history with all your heart. And I did. I hated history in high school. It was the worst subject I could imagine. I didn't understand why anybody would want us to study history when all those people were already dead and there's nothing you can do to change their minds about anything. Why would we want to study a bunch of dead people with meaningless names and a bunch of dates? I hated history class. I hated it. If I was ever, young people, plug your ears for a minute, but if I was ever found off of school grounds during school hours. It was always during history class. I hated history, and to make things worse, I grew up in Canada. And Canadians have the most boring history on the face of the planet. And all the Canadians in the room said, Amen. We are too polite and too kind and too nice to have exciting history. I remember taking that Canadian history textbook in the 11th grade and I opened it up and, and I was looking for something interesting. Oh, please let there be something interesting in our history. And I found it. The title over the paragraph said, The Greatest Civil Disturbance in Canadian History. Oh, here it is. Here's the story I've been looking for. Do you know what the greatest civil disturbance in Canadian history was? It was the Winnipeg General Strike of 1919. Now, by show of hands, how many of you have ever heard of the Winnipeg General Strike of 1919? Anybody? There are two people here that have heard. There's a reason there's only two of you that have ever heard of it. But let me tell you what the Winnipeg General Strike of 1919 actually was. It was right after World War I. A bunch of people are out of work. So 6,000 angry Canadians, if you can picture that now, 6,000 angry Canadians are gathered in front of Winnipeg City Hall, and they're agitated, and things get out of control. The mob gets angrier and angrier and angrier, and at the height of their anger, they pushed over an electric streetcar. <laughs> and that was it. That's the biggest civil disturbance in Canadian history. Now, it got a little bit worse. It got just a little bit worse. If, if you think back just before 1919, what happened in October of 1917? The Communist Revolution. So everybody was worried about any crowd that might gather for the next few years, and the Royal, Mount, uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were watching them push over the streetcar, and they fired a couple of shots off. And that was the worst civil disturbance in Canadian history. And I closed the book in disbelief. I thought, everybody else at least has great stories. The French gathered their courage. They stormed the Bastille. They overthrew the monarchy. They overthrew the papacy. They were chopping people's heads off and stabbing people to death in bathtubs. But we pushed over a streetcar. <laughs> when you're 15, you want action in your story. I look longingly south at my American cousins. That's you. You were throwing tea in the harbor. You were fighting off the redcoats. You staged a revolution. We threw over a streetcar. <laughs> I hated history class. Now here's what I want you to think about. Here I am, this kid who hates history. And I hated it. I don't see the point. It bores me. I don't understand it at all. And along comes a bunch of Christians known as the Seventh-day Adventists. And you love history. You have charts with dates and lines, and you have historical-sounding people, Hiram Edson, Uriah Smith. Those are not modern names. What are the odds that a group like you is going to reach a kid like me who hates history? How are you going to reach me with the everlasting gospel? So if you were to go to the so-called church growth and marketing experts, and I've been there because they have some very valuable things to say, but if you were to go to them, they would tell you the odds of reaching me with the everlasting gospel, the three angels' message, and all that historical prophetic stuff, not very good. They're going to tell you, forget about it. Listen, you can't reach a kid like this with a message like yours. That is not going to work. If you start a lecture about Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome and the Waldensians and the Reformation, this kid's going to fall asleep before you ever finish your first lecture. He's going to walk out of the room. And don't you even think about the lecture format or a sermon format because that kid is the MTV generation. And I was. MTV was brand new back then. Still played music. Now I'm not sure what they do. It was bad then. It's worse now. You're not going to reach a kid like that. You're going to have to change everything to reach that kid. You're going to have to change your method. You're going to have to change your message. There is no way you're going to reach him. And I've got to tell you something. On the surface, I've looked at what the church growth experts have said. 
I've seen the studies, and it looks pretty good. I mean, logically, it makes sense. These people have their finger on the pulse of modern culture, and they've got the data and the charts to prove what they're saying. You can't reach a kid like that. You're going to have to change everything up. And because it seems so logical, we're tempted to listen. We're tempted. And, and if the experts tell us, well, the studies prove that the West is becoming less and less and less religious... We look at ourselves and we say, well, maybe we should be preaching less and less Bible and trying something else. The truth is, by the way, you you are just not an irreligious nation. They can say that Christianity is in decline in America, but right now 34% of Americans still attend church, 34%. And when the American Constitution was ratified by New Hampshire in 1789, that number was only 17%. There are twice as many people going to church now as there were at the founding of this nation. It's nonsense. This is one of the most religious nations on earth. I've come from an irreligious place, and I'm telling you, people are open about their faith here. It isn't even close to over in America. But we listen, and people say, well, you can't just preach religion anymore. You can't just open a Bible. So we look for something else. And they tell us, well, young people, they don't want to go to church. So maybe we should make church look like it isn't church anymore. We listen to that. The truth is that over in Europe, they tried that already 30 years ago, and the kids are going back to having church because that's the new and cool thing. They tell me secular people won't listen to Bible prophecy. They won't believe in God. So you really need to rethink this whole idea of preaching out of books like Daniel and Revelation. That's not going to work. And we listen. We listen to what they say because they have the numbers to prove it. And on the surface, it makes really good sense. That makes really good sense. It appeals to my logic. Or if I'm really, really honest, maybe I would have to admit that it really kind of appeals to my fear more than my logic. Because you think about it, God says, take this message, the three angels' messages, Revelation 14. Take this message and go and preach it to those people, and you go and look at those people, and you can't figure out how in the world that's ever going to connect or ever going to work, and it scares us. And so when the experts tell us it can't be done, we kind of breathe a sigh of relief. Oh, well, we would do it if we could, but the numbers are in. We're going to have to wait for the latter rain, and the Lord is going to finish the work in righteousness. There's only one little problem with all those studies, one tiny little problem. I've collected them all, and there's some good stuff in there. I do listen to them. I do look at the numbers, but I will not let them talk me out of my faith. I won't. There's one little problem. I've lined them all up side by side on a desk. And I collect them all and I look. And this study says I can't preach the three angels' messages to this part of the population. And this study says that I can't preach the three angels' messages to this part of the American demographic. And this study says I can't preach it to this group and this one says to that group. And by the time I'm done whittling down the American public, there's nothing left, nobody I can preach to. Nothing. And what's left over doesn't look anything like the promise of God. It doesn't look anything like that multitude that we read about in Revelation 7 that is so big you can't count it. It doesn't look anything like God's promise to Abraham. God gets Abraham up in the middle of the night. Get out of your tent, Abraham. Come outside. Lord, it's the middle of the night. What do you want? Look up in the sky, Abraham. What do you see? I see stars. How many? I don't know. Start counting, Abraham. Start counting. How many do you see? With the naked eye, you can see 5,000. Now with the Hubble telescope, we can see 100 billion in our galaxy, and there are 100 billion galaxies. How many do you see? I can't count them. That's right. That's how many descendants you're going to have. That's how big my kid. Abraham, come down here to the riverbank. Grab a handful of sand. How much do you have? I have a handful, Lord. No, no. How many grains of sand do you have, Abraham? I don't know. I can't count them all. That's right. That's how many descendants you are going to have. That's how big my kingdom is going to be. All these things they tell me about who will listen to God's last day message don't look anything like the promise of God. God said in the last days, we will preach his message to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Doesn't look like that. So, so here's the decision that we've got to make. Either God made a mistake with the method and the message, or there's a problem with the studies. I love academia. Here I am knocking academic studies on the campus of Southern Adventist University. I'm not that way at all. I love study. I really love study. I think you ought to get all the study you can and larger horizons and study, right? But I just have one question. 
In thousands of years of human recorded history, how often has academia been 100% right? I know, I'll leave by the back door. I'm on a college campus asking that, but academics, there is a reason that they have the 67th edition of your textbook for sale this year. (laughs) Because they're always having to tweak it. They're always having to change it. How often has human logic been completely infallible? How often? Do you know that scientifically we believed for centuries that men had more teeth than women? Did you know that? Do you know why we believe that? It's because one day Aristotle, parading around in front of a class like a pagan Greek philosopher loved to do, suddenly, I don't know what he was lecturing on, I have no idea how he went from his topic and made that leap in logic to teeth, I don't know. But some point in the lecture he says, and men have more teeth than women. And everybody looked at each other and said, well, it's Aristotle, it's got to be true. And nobody thought to check it out for hundreds and hundreds of years. Nobody sat down afterwards and said, Mrs. Aristotle, come here, open your mouth. Want to see how many teeth you've got? How often, how often have we been utterly infallible? Now, am I against academia? No. I just want to underline that again. Get all the education you can. I love education. Take advantage of it, especially here. Do it. But the problem comes when we begin to take ourselves too seriously. It's good to study, but it's a mistake to place complete faith in your own thinking. It is. The Bible talks about this condition where you can be ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. You can always be second-guessing yourself, always thinking it through again, and never have a place to stand with any certainty. You and I have always been prone to mistakes, but not once in thousands of years have we ever had to apologize for the words in this book. Not once. Ever. I mean, we've had to apologize for how we behave. We've had to apologize for the things we say, but we have never had to apologize for what's in the Word of God. So if it comes down to what God asks of my life, if it comes down to me choosing between what somebody tells me or what the promises of God say is possible, if I have to choose, I can tell you which one's the safer bet. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of the Lord stands forever. You have to make a choice. Choice is obvious. I'm going with the Bible, and I know it's right. Do you know how I know? Because I'm the kid who detested history class. And here I am in my office ripping open a box from Amazon.com. It must be my 2,000th volume on history. I'm not kidding. There are at least 2,000 history books in my house, at least. And the kid who hates history less than a quarter century later is ripping open another history book. Why? Because now I know Jesus. And now it doesn't even matter who wrote the history book. It could be an atheist who wrote the history book. But I can still see the hand of God nudging human history towards the coming of Christ's kingdom. It doesn't matter who wrote the book. Now I love history because it is the story of my Jesus who will establish his kingdom on this earth. I love it. We discount the work of the Holy Spirit when we say that the promise of God is not possible. I hope you don't mind if I speak boldly this evening. Some people are saying, you already have, Sean. No, I'm just getting warmed up. (laughs) It's warm here too, isn't it? I had to move to elevation to stay in the United States of America. I live in Colorado now because it's too hot everywhere else in America. I want to be open. Some of the reasons people give me for not doing what they now call traditional evangelism drive me crazy. They do. First of all, it drives me crazy when you call it traditional evangelism. I mean, preaching the Word's been going on for 2,000 years. I, that's pretty traditional, I suppose, but I'm sticking with it. Worked for 2,000 years. It, not going to stop working for one century. But the reason we put the word traditional there is to try and discount it. Don't do that. Don't do that. The reasons people give me for not doing it drive me nuts because I know they're not true. I've seen with my own eyes that they're not true. People say, Sean, you can't go out and just reach people who live like hedonistic pagans with the message of the Bible. Sounds logical, except for the fact that I once was a hedonistic pagan, and you did reach me with the words of the Bible, and I have seen thousands more come since then with my own eyes. Don't tell me it doesn't happen. I watch it happen every year. Pastor. The studies now prove that you can only reach people over 55 years of age with the traditional prophetic approach. That one bothers me more now that 55 is so close. (laughs) 
can't reach anybody younger than 55. No, I was 22 when you reached me with the three angels messages and I have watched tens of thousands of young people come since I've seen them with my own eyes. Don't tell me it doesn't work. Pastor, the only people who will come to a traditional evangelistic meeting are people who have never ever been to college. We have to do something else for the academic mind. Seems okay. I was college educated when I listened. I've seen thousands more come with a college education. And, and I've watched professors come. I've watched PhDs come to the gospel. And I don't know if you've noticed, but Jesus always preached one size fits all stories. It didn't matter who was in the audience. The words of Jesus work for everybody. Whether they're a PhD or they're working in the fields, those stories were told to one audience with everybody in it. And they work. And I'm not going to second guess what Jesus did. Not going to do it. Folks, we need to just stop talking ourselves out of doing this. We need to believe that God knew what he was doing when he gave us this message. He knew what he was doing when he gave us the methods he gave us. And, and, and he knew what he was doing when he told us who the audience was. Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. People have asked me, you know, ever since I got started, what's going to be your niche, Sean? You're going into ministry. Are you going to be a youth pastor? Are you going to be for the white collar, the blue collar? What's your niche? And I've always fought that. Because there's only one niche in this world that matters. You know what the niche is? I do have a niche. It's sinners. And the neat thing about sinners is you can find them everywhere. They're everywhere. <laughs> They're at Nordstrom's and Walmart. They're at the gas station. They're everywhere. I ran into I don't know how many sinners today. The world's full of them. You won't run out of people to share Jesus with if your target is sinners. Do you suppose for a moment that God, as we are meeting here in this auditorium, that God is in heaven right now and he's gathering the angels around and he says, Gabriel, bring a notebook and a pen. Why, Lord? Well, because I really blew it when I gave the remnant church the three angels' messages. I did not see that postmodern secular generation coming. I don't know how I missed that, but we need a complete rewrite on the message that my church is going to preach. Do you see it? Not a chance. God didn't blow it. And if our churches are in decline, or our work is not moving forward, and God didn't blow it, maybe we're blowing it. See, I, th I think one of our biggest problems in North America is somehow we've gotten this idea we're in charge of the work. It's up to us. I don't think we've lost the desire to see souls come into the kingdom. I don't believe that for a moment. I don't think our hearts have stopped aching when we see empty spots in the church pew. That doesn't, we still ache. We still want to see it grow. But somehow we've come under this idea that the work is actually up to us, that God gave us an assignment. Jesus said, I'm about to go back to heaven. I'll be back in 2,000 years. Go make disciples of all nations. How, Lord? I don't know. You figure that out. I'll be back in 2,000 years. That's not the way it works at all. We've gotten this idea that we have to come up with the method. And we've been doing some very strange things because of that. Some very strange things. Let me pick an example that I don't think will step on too many toes. I was driving across the great state of Missouri. See, I pronounced that right, even for a Canadian. Well, somebody from Missouri out there. <laughs> I heard an amen. And I got the radio on in the car. And I'm driving along, and I hear this ad for the Church of God Chicken Grill. And I don't know about you, but that got my attention. I got to hear about the Church of God Chicken Grill. What in the world is the Church of God Chicken Grill? So I turn up the radio. And here's what the Church of God Chicken Grill is. I did my homework. There was this church that was languishing. They couldn't get men to come to church. And that's always the case. Men are stubborn, right? There's a reason we die younger. We just never admit we're doing something wrong. And they couldn't get guys to come to church, and somebody got this idea. You know what we're going to do? We're going to have a tailgate party in the parking lot of the church. The guys will come, and we'll get the best barbecue chef in town to come and cook chickens. That'll get everybody into church. And sure enough, it did. The parking lot was full the next weekend, and they had barbecued chicken, and the men showed up in droves, and they had a great time. They really did. And the next week, there were even more men, and the week after that, even more men, and the barbecue got bigger and bigger and bigger, and as the barbecue got bigger and bigger and bigger, the church service got smaller and smaller and smaller until they finally just closed the church and opened a restaurant. <laughs> Bait and switch doesn't work. I'm going to demonstrate that tonight. It doesn't work. There was a 
noted Luther, uh, I almost said who? A notable denomination in Scandinavia who decided we can't get young guys to read the Bible. It's always guys that are the problem. So they came up with this brilliant idea. It's about 25 years ago. We're going to make a special edition of the Bible for men, the supermodel edition of the Bible. And they were dead serious, and they put pictures of girls in bikinis on the margin of every page. And those Bibles flew off the shelves. They sold hundreds of thousands of copies, and nobody ever read a single one. Amsterdam. They looked at their empty churches in Amsterdam. They said, how can we get people to come inside the church? And they decided years ago, you know what? We're going to let the drug dealers do their deals in the church. It's a nice, safe environment to do a drug dealer. Next thing you know, they had crowds of people in the church. Not one of them ever chose Jesus. We do strange things because we think that we're in charge of the work. Let me ask you a question. What, you know, we've thrown around the word relevant a lot in the last few decades. What makes our message relevant to the community? Think about that. Somehow we've gotten the idea it's up to us to make it relevant. Let me ask this. Is it our job to make people think the three angels' messages are relevant? Or is it our job to find people who think the three angels' messages are relevant? Two different things. Is it our job to make people think that what we have to say is relevant, or is it our job to go and find the people who do think that it's relevant? Two different things. Let me show you an interesting passage. It's found in the book Desire of Ages, because in this one paragraph, in this one paragraph, God, in a nutshell, tells us how evangelism is supposed to work, right? Desire of Ages, page 349. Listen to this carefully. We're going to read through it. We're going to go through it scripturally, and then I'll wrap up for the evening and let you get a good night's rest. But I want you to pay careful attention because we've been making some mistakes. They had listened, speaking to of the disciples. This is chapter 37, the first evangelist. I believe it's even the first paragraph. They had listened to his discourses. They had walked and talked with the Son of God. And from his daily instruction, they had learned how to work for the elevation of humanity. First thing right out of the gate, you're going to have to spend time with Jesus if you want to share him with anybody else. If you don't know him, how can you share him? It's not the big point. Let's keep going. Follow carefully. Everything that's underlined, we're going to revisit more than once. As Jesus ministered to the vast multitudes, who was ministering? Who is it? Oh, there's more of you out there than that. I can actually hear you breathing. Who was doing the ministering? Jesus. As Jesus ministered to the vast multitudes that gathered about him, his disciples were in attendance, eager to do his bidding and to lighten his labor. They assisted in arranging the people, bringing the afflicted ones to the Savior, and promoting the comfort of all. They, now follow this carefully, they watched for interested hearers, explained the scriptures to them, and in various ways worked for their spiritual benefit. They taught what they had learned of Jesus and were every day obtaining a rich experience. There it is in a nutshell. I love that paragraph because the whole system is laid out in one paragraph. Now, there are five points. Point one, Jesus ministers to the multitudes. Point two, the disciples watched for interested hearers. Point three, they explain the scriptures to the interested hearers. Point four, they tell what they knew of Jesus. And point five, the result was they obtained a rich experience. Pretty simple. There it is in a nutshell. Let's dissect it. Let's look at each of those points in the time that we have. Point number one, It's Jesus who ministers to the multitudes. It is not us. We don't drive any of this. There's this story in the book of Revelation. It's one of my favorites, chapters 4 and 5. I mean, the whole book of Revelation is my favorite, but 4 and 5 are special. And you remember the scene. John is in the throne room of God, and he sees God on the throne, a scroll in his hand sealed with seven seals. It's written on the front and the back. You, You know the story. And a voice cries out, Who is worthy to open the seals? And they couldn't find anybody. So John weeps bitterly. And it's important that they open that because if you remember, in chapter 6, they do open the seals and that's when the work of the New Testament church begins to unfold. The white horse, the early apostolic church, the red horse, the church being persecuted by the Persian Empire, or the Persian, Roman Empire, told you I was bad at history. The Persian, the Roman Empire, 
Then we've got the black horse, Constantine's doings, and the pale horse as we move into the dark age. It's the entire history of the church all the way down to the falling of the stars, the beginning of the Millerite movement. It's the work of the church, and if nobody can open those seals, the work of the church cannot begin. It's the whole history of the church in chapter 6, but no sinful human being can open that scroll. And then Jesus walks into the throne room, and he looks like a slain lamb. Where do you find a slain lamb in the Old Testament? In the sanctuary. Revelation 4 and 5 is sanctuary language. I'm convinced, and you can debate it, just don't debate it with me, I need a good night's sleep, but that Revelation 4 and 5 is the inauguration of heaven's sanctuary. Some may disagree, but I have studied this a lot and I've come to this conclusion. They accept the gift of Christ. It takes place, I'm convinced, on the very day that Jesus is installed as heaven's high priest. And until that moment happens, the work of the church on earth cannot begin. Cannot begin. In fact, when Jesus went back to heaven, look at what happens. He says to his disciples, wait here in Jerusalem. You're going to go to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth, but don't you move a muscle, don't you do a thing until what? until the Holy Spirit comes. So they're in Jerusalem, and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls, and the disciples suddenly start preaching in the languages of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people that are gathered there in Jerusalem. And in the midst of all of that, as people are marveling over what they see, Peter stands up in Acts chapter 2 and verse 33, and he says, this that you're seeing here, that you're struggling to understand, Acts 2, 33, this is happening because Jesus has just been exalted to the right hand of the throne in heaven, and he has just received the Holy Spirit and he is shedding it forth on us. We so often say that the disciples received the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It's not quite true. It is true, but it's not quite the accurate picture. Peter says in that same passage, Jesus just received the Holy Spirit and shed it forth on the church beneath. Listen to Psalm 133. I'm convinced it's a prophecy of the day of Pentecost. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, just like on the day of Pentecost. It is like the precious oil upon the head. What is oil a symbol of? Holy Spirit. Running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down the edge of his garments, it is like the dew of Hermon. The day that Jesus begins his ministry as the high priest in heaven's sanctuary is the day that the church's work begins on earth. And the message for you and me is that the whole plan is run from heaven's sanctuary. And you and I don't run any of it. None of it is up to us. Read the Bible. Jesus does it all. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2 that God gives people the gift of repentance. We can't. Jesus said, no one can come to me except the Father draws him. That's, uh, and, and the Holy Spirit, we're told, is the one who brings people under conviction. Read the Bible carefully, folks. We don't do any of it. It's all Jesus' work, and none of it is up to us. Jesus was the one ministering to the crowd in the first century, and he is still the one ministering to the multitudes today. None of it's up to us. You'll never find a command to change that plan anywhere in the Bible. Point number two and three, we'll take them together in the interest of time. Although I got up 10 minutes early, which gives me 20 minutes of extra time. <laughs> Point number two, it says the disciples watched for interested hearers. And point number three, they explained the scripture to those people. Now notice carefully, they're not trying to make people interested. It doesn't say that. They're watching for the interested hearers. They're watching for whoever is listening to Jesus and the words are sinking in. They're looking for people who are responding to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. They're not trying to make people interested. They're looking for people who are interested. And you can't even make people interested, folks. Read your Bible carefully. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Uh, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. We can talk all we want about reaching the secular mind. You can't. You can't. Now, there are very few secular minds out there. People insist they're secular, but every time I sit down with them for a while, I discover they're not nearly as secular as they are mad at God. <laughs> mad at somebody they say doesn't exist. 
But if somebody were truly secular, there's nothing you could do to make them interested in spiritual things. That's not what I say. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. There's nothing you can do. You can't make them interested. So why invest all of your energy on people we think aren't interested? It's much wiser to go and look for the people who are interested. You'll notice in the vision in Gospel Workers, I think it's page 136. I, it's somewhere between the two covers of that volume. Anyway, there's a vision where Ellen White is looking at a group that are picking berries. She's out picking with them. And she says to the group, don't you pick the green ones. Pick the ones that are ripe. Don't touch the green ones. You'll ruin them. That's fascinating to me. We can't make people interested. God handles all of that from heaven's sanctuary. What the disciples did was find the people who were listening and recognizing God's voice. And what did they do with those people? They explained the scriptures to them. Why? Because when you open the pages of this book, which was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and you do that with people who are hearing the Holy Spirit, they suddenly recognize the voice in this book. And they think, that sounds awfully familiar. I know because it's exactly what I went through and I've watched tens of thousands of people go through that since. Something sounds right and true in the Word of God because the Spirit's been prompting them. We're the last people who come to the equation. God always gets there ahead of you. Always. We're just there to help them connect the dots and invite them home. That's why we're there. When I realized this, my life as an evangelist got a whole lot easier and it went better too. I used to lay awake all night. Oh, I'm going to have to have an altar call tomorrow night. I said I was going to have and have an altar call, and I might go on. You know what it's like. I'm going to go on for 20 minutes, and, and nobody will come up, and I'll just plead, is there one person here, just one more who might come? And, and, and what if I'm not convincing enough? And then I realized, in the work of God, you don't have to be convincing because you can't convince anybody. The Spirit convinces. You appeal, and that's different. All I have to do is appeal to those that are under conviction to do the right thing with their conviction. And when I saw that, when I realized that, it got so much easier overnight. Now it's fun because I'm there to watch what God is doing, not to try and impress God with what I'm capable of. Take a careful look at the book of Acts. You'll notice something really interesting. There's no such thing as a cold interest anywhere in the book of Acts. Not one. Go looking. See if you can find them. In Acts chapter 2, who does Peter baptize at Pentecost? Devout men from every nation under heaven. They're already interested in spiritual things. Peter is preaching to a crowd that God got to first and gathered in front of the preacher. That's how it worked. Acts chapter 8, the angel says, Hey, Philip, I've got a Bible study for you, and you are so late. The guy's halfway through the book of Isaiah. He's riding in his chariot. Come on, we got to get going now. Acts chapter 9, God says, Ananias, I've got a Bible study for you. Oh, I like Bible study, Lord. Who do you have in mind? Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus. I can't give a Bible study. He puts people in jail. He has them put to death. I can't. Don't worry about it, Ananias. Don't worry. I already pushed him off his horse, and he's blind, and he's sitting in the dark for three days. He is ready for this Bible study. (laughs) Read it. Acts chapter 10, first Gentile convert. Who is it? Cold interest? No, Cornelius, devout man, already giving gifts to the temple. There's no such thing as a cold interest, folks. They don't exist. If you're sharing Jesus with somebody, God got there first. And they're everywhere. They're everywhere. They're falling out of the trees, but we're so busy working on what we weren't told to do that we're missing them. Crowds are bigger today than they've ever been. People say, oh, you can't get a crowd out. We get anywhere from 1,500 to 3,000 on opening night. They stay for a month. And they make decisions because God's bringing his children into the remnant church. I remember I was in Vaughn's. Do you have Vaughn's grocery stores here? It's like Safeway. You all have Safeway, right? You have got the natural market. I'm in the grocery store. (laughs) And I'm doing Friday afternoon shopping because if I'm ever in town on a Friday afternoon, Jean sends me to the grocery store. But I'm not allowed to pick whatever I want because I'll second guess everything she always buys. I'll always find something cheaper, I'm Dutch. And I'm going up and down the aisles and I'm talking on my cell phone, getting instructions from Jean, get this peanut butter, get that toilet paper. And, And as I'm walking down the aisle, I, I, the woman behind the deli counter thinks I'm talking to her. She can't see the phone. 
And so I hang up really quickly. I put the phone in my pocket and I said, oh, it's so rude. I hate it when people do that to me. I'm so sorry. I was talking to my wife on the phone. I wasn't actually talking. She said, that's all right. I forgive you. She said, but now that I have your attention, I've got great news for you. I said, what's the great news? She said, we've got whole roasted chickens on sale for $5 a piece. I said, that sounds like a really good deal. She says, would you like one? I said, no. She said, why? She says, I'm a vegetarian. She says, you're making that up so you don't have to buy a chicken. I said, no, no, I really, I am a, I'm a vegetarian. I don't eat chicken. I, why don't you eat chicken? She said, well, why'd you, did you grow up vegetarian? She can't imagine how anybody would be a vegetarian otherwise. And, and I said, no, no, I, I, I decided to be a vegetarian. Why did you do that? I just found out it was better for me. Oh, she said, that's fascinating. I used to be a vegetarian. I said, really? I said, so what made you change? She said, oh, it's a long story. I said, okay. She said, no, no, you don't understand. And she got quite assertive. I was really, really vegetarian. I said, I don't know what really, really vegetarian is. Uh, she says, no, you don't understand. Every weekend, my mother made a special K roast. And I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but alarm bells started going off in my head. I, this is an ex avenus It's got to be because no one else on earth would ever eat special K roast. Uh, So I decided to change what I was saying. I said, ma'am, that's fascinating. I dropped the word vegetarian. I said, that's really fascinating to me. You grew up Adventist and I didn't. She said, yeah, and then she went, oops, like she'd let a secret out of the... <laughs> I said, I knew it, I knew it, and I'm an Adventist minister and God sent me to the deli counter today because I bet you haven't been in church in years. And she started to cry behind the counter and she said, that's exactly true and I was praying about it this morning. Spend all the time you want talking about who can't be won. But I'm telling you, they're falling off the trees all around us, folks. There are hearts aching for heaven all around you, living up and down your street and they put up a brave front. But if you were to just ask God to show you who it is that's ready, he'd show you they're there. They look for interested hearers, they explain the scriptures to them. This is such a basic principle. We want to try everything else, but you understand that if God gets there first, the Bible works really well. <laughs> it's such a basic principle that on the road to Emmaus, Jesus comes across two really disillusioned disciples kicking the dirt. They're like postmoderns. They used to know what they thought and believed, and now they're not sure if anything matters or is true anymore. And Jesus could have just flashed through in his glory and said, here I am, I'm okay, but it's not what he did. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in the scriptures all things concerning himself. Gave him a prophecy Bible study. That's what he did. You know, if that's how Jesus does it, I'm not going to try something else. It works. Point number four, the disciples told the people what they personally knew of Jesus. This is really why God brings you into the equation. It is. There's nothing more powerful than your personal testimony because they'll hear the voice of the Spirit in their heart. They'll read what the Spirit writes in the Bible. And the next question is, I wonder if this is true. I wonder if this would work for me. And so God brings you into the equation to give them a little bit of hope. There's a story in Daniel chapter 6. It's one of my favorites. Darius can't sleep. I love it because I've never slept through the night in my entire life that I remember. I'm a chronic insomniac. So when I find someone in the Bible who can't sleep, I'm thinking, good, it's not just me. And he can't sleep because he's done something awful. He made a decision that ends in death and it's utterly irreversible. It's not unlike what the entire human race has done. And he might put up a brave front, he might not admit it in front of his counselors, but he's up at night pacing the floor of his bedroom, wondering how he's going to undo the problem he's created. Just like all the people living in your town. Put up a brave front, but they're pacing the floor, they're in tears in their bed because their life is a ruin. And early in the morning he goes down to the lion's den, or really more accurately the the tomb, because it's so clear it prefigures Jesus. There's a stone rolled over the door that's been sealed, and someone who should have been dead is alive that morning. And he calls into the tomb, 
the lion's den. Daniel, are you okay? That, that's not what he says. Daniel, the God whom you serve continually, has he been able to help you? Why does he phrase it like that? Because if Daniel's alive, maybe that same God can do something for him. Your neighbors are putting up a brave front, but if you profess Jesus Christ, I'm telling you they're watching you. They're hoping and waiting because nobody in their right mind would want the gospel to not be true. Really. I remember I was in an evangelistic meeting one time and a young guy came for 25 days. And afterwards, he sat down and he says, I don't know if any of this is even true. How do we even know Jesus ever lived and the Bible is just a bunch of fairy tales? And I thought, you don't come 25 days and really believe that. I remember turning the Bible around, pushing it across the desk to him. And I asked a question. I didn't know what to say. I said, let me ask you this question. Do you, do you hope this is true or do you hope it's not? And he began to cry. He said, how in the world could I ever hope that that's not true? I said, good, that's a good start. You didn't come here by accident. Let's start at the beginning again. They're watching us. You, you can argue with everything. You can argue the facts in the Bible. People can argue about the Sabbath. They can argue about baptism. They, can argue. they can't argue with your testimony. They can't argue with mine. They cannot argue with I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. They can't argue with that. They try. Sean, you're still rotten. True. But I'm not as rotten today as I was yesterday, and by God's grace, I'll be a little less rotten again tomorrow. He's real, and he's changing me, and he could change you. Point number five. Because they followed God's plan, they obtained a rich experience. So many of us wonder why there's such little joy left in our Christian experience, why it seems like a drudgery. Here, here it is. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua's just inherited the mantle of leadership, and that's a tough one. I mean, you, you don't want to follow a spectacular success like Moses. You want to follow a failure. It must weigh heavy on him. How am I going to be a leader among these people? And as he's outside the camp one day, the commander of the Lord's hosts appears with his sword drawn. It's, it's Jesus. It's a Christophany. And he's got the sword drawn and he explains the whole plan to Joshua. Now Joshua has to go back to the children of Israel and explain what the plan is. He's one of two people from the original generation still ready to go into the promised land. It's been a long time out there in the wilderness and it kind of reminds me of a movement of people who are now several generations past the founding of this movement. Past the people who were able to say, the Lord has shown me. He goes and says to the children of Israel, it's time to go in. And everybody cheers. Woo, we want to go in. We don't want to be like grandma and grandpa and die out here in the wilderness. That would be a bad fate. And we are ready to go in. What's the plan? Well, I guess we're going to have to cross the river, aren't we, uh, Joshua? We're going to have to cross the river and we better get started on a bridge. We don't need a bridge, he says. What do you mean we don't need a bridge? It's flood season. That river is six feet deep. And if we don't build a bridge, we're going to lose all our short soldiers as we go across the river. And that's not going to leave many of us left because we've been in slavery for centuries and we're all short. We're all going to drown. We need a bridge. Don't need a bridge. What's the plan then, Joshua? You're going to follow the ark. It always comes back to heaven's sanctuary, doesn't it? Follow the ark. Follow the lead of the throne room of heaven. And they step into the river and the waters part. We can't believe that works so well, Joshua. That's amazing. What's the next plan? Let's start picking off all the little rinky-dink villages around here. No, I got a better plan than that. I'm told we're going into Jer Jericho. Jericho! That's the toughest, baddest city here on this side of the river. We can't take, we better get started. We need spears and we need bows and arrows and we need a battering ram and we better start building earthen works and, and, and get, no, none of that. What's the plan? We're going to march around the city following the ark. Really? Yeah, seven days in a row. That's a horrible plan, Joshua. They're going to pick us off one by one from off of the city wall. That is exactly what we're going to follow the ark. That doesn't make sense. It never makes sense to us, does it? Follow the ark, and they do. And without ever lifting a finger, the walls fall down. They never touch it. 
Have you noticed in that story that as the walls fall down, there's a mighty shout just like there is at the second coming of Jesus? And the trumpet is blown just like it is at the second coming of Jesus? Have you ever noticed in Joshua 6.19 it says that when the walls came down, the gold, the silver, the brass, and the iron in that city were absorbed into God's treasury? Just like in Daniel chapter 2, the kingdoms of this earth, the gold, the silver, the brass, and the iron are crushed by the stone and blown away, and the kingdom of God fills this whole earth. The story of the conquest of Jericho is a type of the second coming of Christ. And all they had to do was follow the ark wherever it led them and do God's bidding, and the wall fell down without them touching it. And God's kingdom comes into this world without our assistance. God does it all and he invites us along and it's time for us to stop rethinking everything and just do the one thing Jesus asked us to do before he went back to heaven. There was only one thing and if we did it we'd watch the walls fall down and we'd watch the church ranks swell and Jesus would come. puts joy in your experience. People tell me, but where are the miracles? There are all these miracles in the New Testament. When do I get to see a miracle? I'm telling you, they're taking place all over this planet right now, but God doesn't perform miracles for our entertainment. He doesn't show up at our house to perform a miracle to entertain us. He's out there on the front lines bringing his children home, and if you want to see the miracles, go out on the front lines, and I guarantee you will see them. I have seen almost everything that you've read about in the book of Acts with my own two eyes. It's still taking place, but God doesn't bring it to you. Go down where he's doing it and join him, and you will have a rich experience, and your faith will grow. We had this house in California, and it's going to sound grand, but it was a, a dump. But we had a spiral staircase. That's why we bought it. Gene said, we can only afford a dump, but at least it has a spiral staircase, and we can play Gone with the Wind or something. And <laughs> Spiral staircase. And Whenever my wife went out, I would take my kids, who were little then, and I would let them climb up the outside of the banister on that staircase. And there was a little landing at the top about 18 inches deep and two feet wide, and they would sit there kicking their legs. And this is one of those things you can only do when mom's out, right, dads? Right? You let them play with the power tools and stuff when mom's out. And I would stand beneath on this hard floor. It's about nine feet up. And I would yell to my, you know what I'm yelling, right? Jump! And they would, they would jump off and they would come down so quick like lemmings, bang, bang. I would almost miss one because they'd come off together. <laughs> and they would laugh and they would run up the stairs and they would sit there kicking their legs again, jump, and they'd jump off and I would catch them and we would do it again and again and again until I heard Gene's car pull up in the driveway and then we would go and play Legos or something really safe. And, <laughs> and then came the day where they sat up on the little ledge and they said, jump! And they hesitated for a moment. That hurt. Where was the trust? Aren't you going to jump? Ah, oh, Dad, your eyesight's not what it was. And He had a back surgery and it hurt. Every night, God would come into the Garden of Eden, walk us through and delight us, and we would jump. And then came the day we stopped jumping. Dads can understand what that must feel like in a little bit. We quit jumping. We broke trust with God. So what has he done to help us build trust? He gives us the impossible task. Take this message and preach it to those people. That, that's not even possible, Lord. God says, jump, I'll catch you. I promise I will. You're going to need faith to live in the kingdom of heaven, folks. It runs on faith. You're not going to know everything when you get there. Lucifer wasn't allowed in the counsels of God. You won't be either. And God's given us assignment, not because he needs us, but because we need it. We need to learn to jump again. And I can tell you after a quarter century now, 
He has never not caught me. Jump. Father in heaven, in the quiet of this moment, we know what is supposed to happen in our churches, in our neighborhoods, and in our homes. But we've grown afraid. Give us the courage to trust what you say and to leap. And let our experience be a rich one too. And above all, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.